So Katie, um, until we're live, but I can just let you know, Katie's like has done everything, and she <laughs> she's a pilot and a military officer and and a musician. And so, I, do you have pictures of of playing the flute in space? You might see them later. You're right. So Katie's just all around awesome, as you can already tell. Um, and so we're so fortunate to have her with us for the entire weekend. And um, and she's got some great experiences up above the earth. How many people get to say that? So welcome, Katie. <laughs> well, my mom was just glad that I got a job in a place I'd actually been some of my life, you know, outer space. <laughs> so uh, I, I didn't get to see everything this morning, but I enjoyed every single minute of the things that I saw. I mean. I, I don't know what it's like for you, but for me, it's actually really, it's nice to be part of the future. And you women are the future. And if any of us can be making a difference, and, and I loved the stories that we heard, I liked the way people told them. And it takes a lot to come up and share. And you, you who are more the audience than the people who've been on the stage, you know, just realize that the people on the stage are just regular people, and it's not that they know that their story is the best one in the, in the world to share, but it's their story, and they share their story, and there's such value in sharing your story. So this afternoon, we're going to go into actually making and learning skills and all sorts of things, and so I thought I would share some of what I knew about um, robotics with you. And I just wanted to, uh, as Beth said, I, I've been an astronaut for a while. I've been on three missions, two shuttle and one space station mission. And that space station mission was four years ago. I was up there for six months. And I would have stayed another six months in a minute. It was so, so amazing. But we're just going to focus on one aspect of what it was like to live up there. But I did just want to kind of show you around a little bit, which is this is our space station. Uh, and it's, it's very huge. People think about us being stuffed into a little tiny space, but it's big. We are not staying in the, the place that's sort of a, a horizontal across the football field there is where all the outside equipment is being cooled. And we stay sort of in the vertical axis. It's about eight train cars all put together in a row without the seats in them. I mean, it's giant and massive. And, and there's always times to be alone and, and you know, not have everybody around. We're usually up there with a crew of six. Um, and I want you to take, uh, pay special attention to the guy on the right, um, the guy that doesn't have as much hair as I do. Um, so that's my friend Scott Kelly. He's in space again right now. I'm insanely jealous. But, you know, it's his turn. You know, we're all there for the mission. Scott's part of a very special mission, the one-year mission, where he also has a twin brother that was up in space. Um, he's been in space several times. And Scott, so Scott and I were on a space station crew, and his brother was going to visit us on the space shuttle. And the joke was that I would get to pick which one of them would stay after the shuttle left. <laughs> But it ended up, the missions got kind of out of order, so I was up there with Scott, and then later on his, uh, his brother Mark came up. So it's kind of like a space family, if you see. And I want you to just, I, I'm going to digress for a minute here, Beth, if I'm allowed to. Um, if you look at the guy in the middle, not the tall one, that's my crewmate Paolo Nespoli from Italy. Uh, but if you look to the guy who's sitting to my left, um, that's Dmitry Kadratyev. So he and Paolo and I were a threesome, where we go up as, as three, and there's three people already in space. So we join them, now we're six, right? So the three of us, Dima and Paolo and I, spent a lot of time together. And this is a picture of our whole crew, all six of us, really excited about going to space. <laughs> now, I'm not actually making fun of Dima, but I'm pointing it out for a really, I, I, I think an important reason. This is a picture of Dmitry Kondratyev excited about going to space. <laughs> I mean, if you see, in this presentation, you won't see them, but if you look at any other picture on the internet of Dima on our mission, you will see him looking exactly like this. In, in his country, in the way he grew up, it is not traditional to smile for photos, and he is not a person that shows much outwardly. So here is a person on my team that I have to find out more about. You know, you have to take that extra time to figure out what is meaningful to them, what is not meaningful, when can you talk to them, what should you talk to them about if you really want to share. So that was a, this picture actually says that um, to me and I thought it was very interesting and for having a crew of six people that were very different, we were just um, astoundingly successful and it was, we were very close to each other, each of us in different ways. 
see if this goes. Um, when you think of space, you think of space walking, which of course all of us want to do, and I'm there with my spacesuit. Uh, it's a little lighter in space. It uh, weighs 300 pounds down here. So for women, I would say it's one of the biggest physical challenges of what we do. And for me, what that meant was I probably can't play the game in the same way as the other people on the team, mostly guys on the team, right? And so the part of it that's the hardest, about, hardest for me in that 300 pound suit when we practice at a big giant swimming pool is the physical strength part. So my strategy was to do every single little bit of homework that I could before every practice run so that when I got in that pool, in that spacesuit, the only thing that I had to think about was how to get this hand around that and have the leverage to do this. Because when you're trying to do it, it's actually really hard. And, <clears throat> and so, when, but you still need to know, well, where am I gonna put that? What am I gonna do next? So I really studied all those answers. Where am I gonna go next? What's around the corner? What is so-and-so supposed to be doing while I'm doing this? People who don't have to focus as much on the strength part could actually do that homework maybe real time. But I had to have a different kind of strategy. And I also found a way to modify the way we wore the spacesuit. Um, when we, the spaces are very big and I'm small. And uh, another woman astronaut said, you know, Katie, if I ever had to go in a really big suit, because we eliminated the small suits at NASA, uh, if I ever had to, had to go in a really big suit, I would go out and buy a water skiing vest. And that's what I would wear, because in that spacesuit, in the pool, you have a giant air bubble, all that extra space. Is, it's like being on top of like a, you know, an exercise ball. If you were trying to sit on top of one of those on the water, is that ever going to happen? No, the, 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 the ball, the air, is always going to be up, right? And so the air portion would always be up, and it just makes you harder to control yourself in the pool when you're practicing. And so she had this advice for me. I talked about it with a bunch of people, and we modified things. And it used to be that only, well, small girls that needed help, you know, that really couldn't cut it the same way everybody else did it, that they used that system. And now a bunch of people, including guys, use that system because it keeps you centered in the suit. It makes it easier for everybody to work. So you have to find a way to be different and at the same time not so different that you're not playing on the same playing field. And I think that can hold true in some of the things that you're thinking about doing. So a little bit, I know I promised robotics, Beth. We all live here whenever you have to say well, it's, you know, it's really fun stuff to share, um, and, and this is really pertinent. This is a story I'm going to tell you, and it happened for me uh, four years ago. Actually, almost exactly four years ago. And it's going to happen again next week to Samantha Cristoforetti up in space on the space station. So this is about the supply ship business. At NASA, you hear about the space shuttle going away. Even my relatives ask me if the space program is over. I'm like, well, if it's over, how come I'm so busy? And you know, we transitioned something that everybody knew about. The space shuttle was older, it needed to be retired so that we could get on with the other things we needed to do. And so in the space program, we've taken the things that we know how to do, which is getting people and stuff up and down to a space station. It's not easy, it can't be taken casually, but we know how to do it. But NASA is the exploration agency, and so we are transitioning those jobs to our commercial partners, people like Orbital Sciences, Boeing, SpaceX. And so, so far, they've been doing our supply ships. When I did this, and that's what these pictures are from, this was, uh, the Japanese supply ships came first, and this was only the second time that it had ever been done uh, up on a space station. And what's kind of, what's, the thing to think about here is that you see the space station there, and you see the big robotic arm. There's something big in front of it, so it looks like there's a big box on it, but there's not really. So you see the robotic arm stretched out, and then you see in the Earth there that little kind of like, you know, satellite-like looking thingy. Okay, so that thing, oops, let me do this. That, whoop, there we go. Um, that thing is this. It is the HTV, um, Japanese Transfer Supply Vehicle. It is the size of a school bus. It weighs 16 tons. And so here's the space station flying 17,500 miles an hour around the Earth. And here in formation is our supply ship. And our robotic arm has to reach out with me and the controls, reach out and grab that thing, and then pull it closer 
attach it to the space station, then we go in, we open, check pressure, open hatches, and, and have supplies. And the bad thing that can happen is if you end up, you're trying to grab it and you knock it away. Or you say, you tell it to sort of wait there quietly while you go in and grab, and it doesn't, some mistake happens, some, something happens, and it doesn't wait quietly and it goes a little crazy. It, we can't move the space station. The space station's like a factory, and the supply ship is like a truck pulling up. That's the difference in size. So it just makes it a really critical operation. And the first time um, that it was done, let's see, what, what we see here, now you see that picture a little bit different as it's coming closer and closer and closer. And my advice, now that we've been doing this longer, um, it was significant when Paolo and I did it, is that we impress on people that you know how big that thing is, and when it gets really, really close, like really, really close, it is so big. It's enormous. I think of the sign that says, caution, objects in the mirror may be larger than they appear. Because <laughs> it's so big, and it makes you feel a different way. It makes you feel a little bit nervous. And I think the only way to not worry if you're gonna make a mistake when that thing is big and close and you have to do your thing is to know you've done all your practicing, you've done your preparations, you've, I mean, you're ready. You're as ready as you can be, and then you have to just do your best. And that's the only way that I manage to deal with that kind of uh, pressure. Um, this is Paolo and I uh, actually doing that, and Scott Kelly uh, took, the, took the pictures. And you know, afterwards, I mean, my, my heart was beating, and, and when, People come back, astronauts come back, they share those stories, and I make them share them with each other so that when people get there, they understand what it feels like. And that's some of the sharing that we're doing here today. When people talk about their projects and how they worked out, you sort of hear about the beginning, and you hear about the end, whether they won or not, but they've still, they had a project. But there will be times, there's like these peaks and valleys, and there are times in the middle where everybody thinks that everything is gonna be lost and nothing is gonna work out. I mean, people feel that way. And yet, you just keep going, and things work out. But you can't, you gotta remember afterwards, you forget those times that were so stressful or hard. And so think of what gets you through those, those kind of difficult times. Um, this is a picture of Nicole Stott. She was the first person ever to capture a supply ship that was free flying, we call it a free flyer capture. I was the second person. Sonny Williams, a really good friend of ours from, uh, uh, from the Navy, was supposed to capture the third one, and we thought we sort of saw a little trend. Maybe only girls can capture free-flying supply ships <laughs> with the robotic arm. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that lots of people can, and uh, we were successful. If you look closely at this picture, um, we just happened to capture it right over uh, New York. Can you look at and see Long Island in the background there? In New York City, in the winter? So I guess it was around the end of February that we, or beginning of February that we, that we did this. Can you see the Finger Lakes there, right under it? Isn't that cool? So a successful capture, and that's what Samantha is going to do this week on Monday. Um, if everything's right, the SpaceX company will launch a supply ship, and Samantha is a part of the team that will capture that supply ship. She's up in space right now. She's been there for about four months already. She lands at the end of May. She's an Italian astronaut, uh, fighter pilot, uh, really just interesting, interesting woman that uh, is very, very skilled and likes to share her experience. If you haven't read any of her blogs on Google+, if you don't follow her on Twitter, just start right now and then read backwards because it's really, she's really tried to bring you up there with her and uh, she's just great at it. So she will see this SpaceX Dragon coming here. It is actually already captured there. So this is hopefully what will happen is Samantha will capture that. And then we bring it up and we stick it onto the space station. And that, all, that, that part kind of moves slow. Some of robotics moves very slow. Ro robotics requires a lot of patience and a lot of discipline about doing things the same way every time so you don't make mistakes. This is just showing you another thing, how it looks when you're attaching it to the space station. And then that supply ship, after they unload the supplies, will, uh, and it's everything from food and toilet paper and you know, letters from your sweethearts at home and you know, everything like that from your families. It's all those kinds of things. And it's also experiments, new experiments. 
that are really, really exciting. And so, and some of them have to be done right away, some of them take longer, but we also then load up experiments we've already been doing. When you're up there, you are one giant guinea pig. We do a lot of research that I think, it, a lot that's fascinating, my favorite, is actually osteoporosis research where we lose bone about 10 times faster than a woman who's 70 who has osteoporosis. So what she loses in a year, I would lose in a month in space. And that's really significant. It's a big problem down here on the ground. Your bones get weaker and you are more prone to breaking them and breaking hip bones. But I came back, I can only give you my own personal medical history, but I came back with all the bone that I left with, the same digital amount. When I took an x-ray, it's within a percent, it's the same. That doesn't mean my bones are the same, and we're looking at that process, and because it happens so quickly to us up there, we can take a lot of measurements with blood and urine and all those kinds of things. We take those measurements, that's what we're loading into the SpaceX capsule when it comes in, is those, those samples that need to return to the Earth, and SpaceX gives us that capability to undock and then land in the ocean, recover those samples, and finish the, the research. There's some analysis we just can't do um, up there. So that's the scenario for uh, this next week. I mean, actually, they'll have it up there a few weeks. I wanted to show you um, just other, well, other cool women in space. So you know I'm not the only one, and Samantha's not the only one. This is a great picture on the left is Peggy Whitson. She was the commander of the space station. She's on her way back for her third trip. Above her is Sandy Magnus, the queen of logistics. My friend Marissa here from Civic Hall would uh, really, I think, love to meet Sandy who can just run and organize anything, especially five guys on a spaceship, okay? <laughs> and then to the right is Pam Melroy, um, one of very few women test pilots and one of our only uh, two uh, women shuttle commanders and a total of three women, uh, women pilots. That's right, so they were actually in space at the same time. So Peggy was the commander of the space station, and Pam was the commander of the space shuttle that brought up one of the last big giant pieces of the space station and did an incredibly daring and risky and um, fascinating rearrangement. And there was a solar array that was damaged, and they had to go out there and fix it, and literally did sewing. The, the solution was literally like making cufflinks. They made cufflinks to stitch together different things to, to fix the damaged solar array. It was all designed during the mission, very MacGyver-like. Speaking of which, I want to advertise, I don't know if the same things fascinate you, but uh, just this past couple weeks there was a, something that came out on the internet that uh, you want to, would you like to name the new female engineering hero of our era? We need a new MacGyver. And so tell us your ideas. This is what came out in the, on the internet. Tell us your ideas about what a show like that would look like. What, what would that girl be like or that woman be like? And what kinds of things would be important to her? And what kinds of things would she like to do? And what would her friends be like? And how would she work? And how would she figure things out? So just something for you to think about after the hackathon. You've got time till May 1st. It's a good challenge. So that's uh, Sandy and... Uh, um, uh, Peggy and Pam up there. And then there was a shuttle mission that had uh, three women aboard and Tracy Caldwell was actually on board at the same time. So in that picture, um, starting at the bottom right is uh, Stephanie Wilson. Uh, she's one of our astronauts that was an aeronautical engineer. Everybody's something else first. On the left is Tracy Caldwell, Caldwell Dyson, uh, who's an analytical chemist and could like build those instruments up in space. Amazing. Uh, Dottie Metcalf up on the top left. It's hard to pe see people when they're upside down because we're not used to looking that way. You know, it, it's, it's really interesting and that's what you're here for is to look at things a different way and listen to people who see things a different way. So Dottie is a former teacher and an astronaut and Naoko Yamazaki is an aeronautical engineer from Japan. And just to finish up here, I wanted to show you this picture. It's our crew. You actually see both twin brothers there, Mark Kelly and Scott Kelly, um, and myself meeting President Obama. When I was your age, no one knew I would be in this picture. And that's why you know, we, the mentors and the adults, need to take care of all of you. We don't know which ones will be the ones to change the future. I actually suspect all of you will change the future in some way. But you should take care of yourself, you should value yourself, you should value your voice, 
even if it's different than the others around you, because you belong in pictures like this, and I look forward to seeing which ones they are. You know, at NASA, we have really a long ways to go. We're going back to the moon and Mars as practice places. Our space station is a test bed for going to those places. We have things to learn that we need to do. We have an environmental system that breaks all the time. It cycles, uh, removes CO2 from the air. It breaks literally all the time. There's a note today. It's broken today. Okay, we have backups. We're NASA, we have backups. It's okay, but it doesn't mean we're ready to go to Mars. That's one of the reasons we're not ready to go to Mars. Recycling water, recycling air. Um, the bathroom breaks all the time. And that's a, it's a, it's a, it, for health, it's a, a completely essential piece of equipment. And so those are the kinds of things we need solutions for. We need appropriate places to test them. In, in some ways, things like our Space Apps Challenge are the initial test bed for stuff, I mean, it, it absolutely is a, a place where we are saying, we'd like to have this on our space station. We'd like to have these when we are getting ready to go back to the moon, to use asteroids because they're close, and when we get to Mars. So we are using all of you unashamedly because our mission is really, really important, and we need you. We need the extra people thinking. We need the kind of thinking that you do, the kind of creativity, and we need you to think of stuff that NASA can't, and you wouldn't think maybe you could, but you certainly, certainly, certainly can. And that's why we advertise, and that's why we can't wait for this weekend. Because, uh, oops, sorry, the wrong thing. Um, because we have goals. I just had a slide of Mars, but I think it got lost. Um, because we really have big places to go. Space may not be your thing, but you're going to change something, and you need tools to do it. Goodwill and enthusiasm go a really long way, but you need skills. And this afternoon, through the mentors, I think we're going to see some pretty exciting skills. Thank you. <laughs>